In this series, five comedians from different cultural backgrounds and all at various stages of their stand-up careers will come together to explore the idea of comedy and culture. She has a big eyeballs and a big nose and it was very scary for me, you know what I mean? So far, they've taken part in one workshop with me, Dean Scurry, where we heard a sample of their jokes for the first time and got an idea of their strengths and weaknesses, fears and expectations. But I'm hoping I'll be brave enough to actually get on stage and do something. At the end of their journey, they perform their finely crafted routines at a live show in DCTV's Comedy on the Corner Club. We were colonised by the English, damn it, I, I command the English language. We rock, we rock, we rock! <laughs> Hopefully you'll join them on their journey of exploration into what makes us laugh across cultures. <laughs> So the first workshop last night I thought went really well, exceptionally well. I thought there was a lot of confidence in the group. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Dill! First up was Dill. No problem talking in public, no problem verbalizing what she wanted, no problem holding on to information and releasing it then. It could be a little bit funnier, some of our jokes, and that's hopefully what we're gonna work on over the next couple of weeks. I'm here to tick all your equal opportunities boxes, right? I'm a woman. I'm a foreigner and I'm a lesbian, right? That's right. I'm here to steal all your jobs, eat all your food, and fuck all your women. Hey. Uh, a bit, a bit nerve-wracking because I didn't quite know how it was. This was gonna pan out, you know. Uh, and Dean was he's, he's a brilliant guy. Uh, I felt I felt very supported, you know, very um, very safe. Loved working with the guys and seeing the different angles that all the other comedians were coming. Um, but it was it was brilliant. So next up then was Thomas Thomas McDonough, uh, the traveller of the group. I sensed because I'd seen him before that he was a slight bit nervous. But once he got his first laugh, he just rolled on there. I believe our first workshop, well our second workshop, but the first one with uh, Ed and Killian is on Friday. But um, I've been told that he does a he helps a lot of comedians kind of sort of find their style and what you want to work on and stuff. Being a travel comedian is a once in a lifetime opportunity for me. But um, I'll never do it again. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to be myself a lot more because I, I believe I'll be a lot funnier and I think I'll be a little more confident then as well. What key opens every lock? The pie key. <laughs> if I come up with another joke when I'm on stage, I'd be afraid just to use that because if I don't get the laugh, I'd be kind of lost for a minute, kind of think, okay, where was I a minute ago and I have to go back to this. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Sasha Bikuri! <laughs> Sasha, yeah, I think he's definitely funny. He's a bit more in, intelligent funny than knob gag funny or, you know, physically funny. Uh, maybe if, if he was a little bit more ballsy and put, you know, some of the mad ideas in his head out there without thinking about them too much, without an analyzing them too much, I think he would get bigger laughs. There's a, there's, a, there's a rich Arab in a hospital and he's got a critical illness and he needs a, a, a blood transfusion and he's got a very rare blood group and it turns out that the, the, the Mauritian nurse has the exact same blood group that will save this rich Arab. And the Mauritian nurse goes, listen, I'll, I'll... I asked the guys to bring a joke from their own culture that the rest of the group mightn't get. Sasha brought this joke about the little known stereotype about Mauritians being mean. And uh, the Mauritian goes, well, why did you do that? And the Arab goes, well, I've got Mauritian blood in me. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Jeez. Needless to say, it went down like a lead balloon. Whenever you do stand up, whatever you think is funny, um, when you go out there and you realize it's not, it's always good to have someone else you say, this is the reasons why it isn't there, because you can't come up with all the solutions yourself. It's normally the stuff that you don't find funny that is always turns out to be the funniest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Tabitha! Tabby, Tabitha, the Kenyan from Clondalkin, absolutely fantastic, great personality. She genuinely had some funny things to say. If you know any Africans, you know that we're deeply religious and we're God's warriors and stuff. Like, you know that there's African churches all over industrial estates in Ireland. And, um, but see, where I come from, I was I didn't go to church because I was so into God. I went just for like the seconds of communion. 
because you know that was the only way you were going to get fed. Ever since the international and watching the professionals doing it, I've been kind of really focusing on writing material. Before it was sort of a spontaneous buzzing off people if somebody said something, I'd probably just diss them, like because I'd be quite quick with the uh, insults. Go. <laughs> Fabu, like. He's like a natural entertainer, a natural showman, backflips on the stage. I was surprised actually uh, later when he told us that he uses an American accent. I do this all the time, you know what I'm saying? It's just not about me, it's all about y'all. So I'm gonna hit y'all on this, so. Um, <laughs> do you really, really use the accent? Yeah, this is what I use on stage normally. I think there's a lot of potential for him to be very funny using his own accent and exploring his own accent and even talking about why he uses an American accent I think would be very interesting and very funny. If there's gay people, if there's gay people in, in, in the world, there's got to be gay animals as well. If you notice this, like maybe for example, go to Southern Africa in the jungle and see a big gay lion like Rare, bitch, rare. <laughs> there were some interest moments and some um, kind of moments where there was a bit of tension in the room and some people were dropping uh, dropping bombs, like Fabio's comment about women and I don't know if anybody was sexist or, or racist intentionally. A woman can come out and say, oh, my boyfriend broke up with me because of I did that, it would be funny. Or she can say, oh, I don't give my boyfriend sex all the time, that would be funny. But what else can you say that's going to make a nigga like we that laugh birth, about you? Okay? You know what we I mean? So it's like, I was definitely, myself, was thrown in bits of stuff that would be seen to be racist, but just as a way of storing the shit or adding a bit of colour to the pot, you know? Thank you very much. You you were fantastic today. Great discussions. Really brave to get on stage and expose yourself and tell your jokes. It's got to be phenomenal. So let's all just put our hands in like this again. Call comedy. This is disgusting, can I just say? So they're on, they're on the journey now exploring their own comedy, their own humour, humour in their own community. Doing some workshops with um, Aidan Killian. Um, I think that would be really interesting for them to meet another comedian, to meet a guy who runs a comedy club, and they kind of would probably start to see themselves now as stand-up comedians. Look at my ass, look at my ass, baby! Take that look off your face, quick! Today is the group's first workshop with Aidan Killian. Aidan is a stand-up comedian who also gives workshops in presentation and public speaking. I want our five budding comedians to take a couple of his classes so they can work on their confidence, stage presence and timing. Hello guys, uh, I'm Aidan and you're all very welcome. Unfortunately, there's no sign of Thomas yet, so Aidan has to start the workshop without him. Today uh, I'm going to get the group to be comfortable with an audience. Because I think one of the most important things is that the audience feels comfortable. Because it's not just about I, it's not just about me, the comedian. It's, it's, it's really about the relationship you have with the audience. Because if the audience, if you lose them, they're good people. Usually they're there to laugh, they want to have fun. So if you lose them, they'll go, oh my God, oh my God, he's going to die. Or she, oh, my God, she's, oh, I'm so embarrassed for her. And they're, they're thinking this rather than paying attention to your next joke. So your next joke could be brilliant, but they don't hear it because they're too busy feeling sorry for you. So we need to get the future comedians to be comfortable on stage, to enjoy themselves. Uh, and I think that's, that's the first place to start. So, okay, I'm Aidan. I used to be an investment banker. I worked for a company called Bear Stearns in Tokyo. Uh, I worked in derivatives. I had short hair and a suit. And I was serious and I had to give presentations. But I was quite young to be in the position I was in. So it was difficult for me to give presentations in front of everybody who knew so much more than I did. And I saw these guys on stage doing stand-up comedy and I thought, wow, if I could do that, I could easily give a presentation because you don't have to make people laugh in a presentation. And so I put my name down and I had one month to practice to do three minutes. And it was uh, exhilarating. It was incredible. And the, like the, the buzz you get from making a, a live audience laugh, I think, is the best natural high you can get. Or it's certainly one of them. And it's lots of fun. So what we want is for people to get their own creativity, their own story, their own reality, their own perception, their own ideas, and share it on a stage. Whoever you are, you want to show it on stage, and you want to get people to laugh. So whatever, the, I don't know what that is, whatever is in your world. So I'm not going to write the jokes for you, but we can go through what you have and get you to present it in the most effective way possible. I love observing not just what people do, but I suppose the, uh, what I call the, 
the emotional undercurrents that are there between people and between cultures and the differences that are there too. The humor, the tradition, it's similar. It's so much not that similar. Like the, in Ireland, they don't hit kids really, especially maybe they hit, maybe in, in fingers here they do probably. The dad would just throw them from the, you know, it's, it's it maybe some part of Ireland they do, but not everywhere. Everywhere in Africa, they, you might, my mom has little temper. She will, she will like, you know, spill you just in, in a couple of seconds. Like if my mom, if my, my, sometimes I can be going home, I can be, my, I, I just wake up from sleep and my dad just hit me. I'm like, whoa, why did you hit me for? Say, just in case you do something bad. What, what I'd like to kick off, we just kick off and do one or two exercises uh, quickly, even though Thomas isn't here yet, but I think we'll kick off anyway. So I'd like you all to stand, please. Fabo and Dill to stand here beside me, like this, facing this way. I'm gonna get them to, to practice their eye contact, their breathing, their movement. I want them to be able to die on stage, to do something that's not funny, and to still be comfortable there, just, just to be. And if they can do that, and they can get their timing right, and I'm gonna get, get them to, uh, to see the tools that comedians use. There's, there's usually a structure to laughter. Like, if you make somebody laugh, there's probably a reason for that. So what is that reason? So if they can understand some of the different ways that comedians, the tools that comedians use, I think that would be a good start. Your time starts now. And 30 seconds, all right, cool. <laughs> well done, tell me. Yeah. Fabio, you seem to enjoy that, tell us. It was just, it was just very, it was unexpected. I, I didn't get prepared for this. <laughs> Sasha, you laughed as well, a bit. Ah, oh, this is weird. You don't normally stand this close to someone okay. in this type of space and, 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 and don't say anything. That's not normal. You almost feel like, really vulnerable, I felt vulnerable anyways, and maybe that's why I was laughing, because it's nervous laughter, you know, because somebody's really, like, really seeing you, not just looking at you, like, they're really seeing you. Well, that's how I felt anyways. Magic. Okay, well done. Well done. And I was looking in your eyes and everything. Good work. Oh, you, think love. Huh? you think you're in love? Yeah, it happens, actually. Uh, better be careful. Whenever I'm doing comedy, stand up on stage, I couldn't look at people into their eyes. I just either look down or look up or look above. This is, this is particularly hard, I think, for men in general, and this is a generalization, so you may or may not agree with it, but sometimes men find it more, more difficult to be intimate, because it is a fucking intimate thing to stare at someone for 30 seconds or a minute this close, and you, you said that you can fall in love, and, and often, often you can feel love, because usually everybody has something inside them that, that'll make you love them. And also the Celtic warriors used to do it years when they used to fight each other, two warriors would meet each other and they'd stare in each other's eyes for three minutes. How Irish is that? And then, we're not gonna fight, we're gonna have a staring contest. We're gonna stare in contest, yeah. and, then, and, then, and then they decided whether they wanted to kill each other or not. I would like, I'd like them to be able to, to stand there and be still on stage, to just be, because sometimes we feel a need to act, we feel a need to, uh, to be something else, to be a character. But with stand-up comedy, often it's just about just being and allowing the audience to connect with you. So I need them to be able to live in, in, in the silence, to live in a place of stillness. 30 seconds. How is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, it's funny because if, if I was doing a routine, I'd imagine, and there are people laughing, like obviously not everybody finds everything funny, so people would be laughing at different kind of times. Mm -hmm. So I think it's easier to focus on the people who are laughing and kind of forget about the people who aren't laughing. You do. <laughs> Somber faces. It's, it's, it's actually something you said there is very important uh, because often it's the opposite. On stage, sometimes we notice the people who aren't laughing and we crave their validation, we work harder, harder, and thus we're doing two things wrong. One, we're punishing the people who love us because we're giving them less attention, yeah. and we're rewarding the people who aren't, and if you're giving them more of the same thing, they're probably gonna hate you more. Yeah. But what you said is exactly what you're meant to do. I found it was easier to look at the audience from the stage, purely because there's a bit of distance, so almost, I suppose the distance could be kind of like a little wall. You can build up a little wall, and it isn't so intense as having somebody stare right in front of your face. Right, guys, that's, that's kind of important because if you're able to stand there and be still on stage that's, and, and have an audience not laughing at you, 
Well, that's half the battle, because that means if you tell a joke and nobody laughs, because maybe you fucked it up, or maybe it's not funny, right? Or maybe you got the timing wrong, or just maybe this audience don't like it. But nobody laughs. But then you don't break. Because the problem is if you break, it's problem is if I'm up here and I tell a joke and, you know, I lost my job a while ago, I've been unemployed this long, and nobody laughs, all right? And because they don't laugh, I go back and I break like that. They'll sense it, right? But if they don't laugh and it doesn't make any difference, I hold eye contact for a second and continue speaking. Boom. I, I don't lose the audience. I'll definitely be able to use the exercises because I, I, I'm probably one of the most nervous people here, just purely because I've never done it before. Um, so it, it, it'll be good to kind of put the, some of the tips in practice and to see how it actually works. What is laughter? The definition is it's the audible expression of, of merriment, right? So it's, 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 it's a tool that you can use. You can use it for good or bad. You know, you make a woman laugh, she laughs, you release endorphins, you touch her at that time. She associates your ha happiness with you. Right? So the tool is there, making somebody laugh is quite powerful. How you use it is up to you. Right? It starts with an itch and a tingle, and then it builds and expands. I think what the guys have learned here will really help them, and I hope they remember these exercises and use them on stage. The next exercise with Aiden is all about timing. He asks them to play around with wards and silence. They start by saying the first thing that comes into their heads, speaking over each other. It's not normal, you know what I mean? She has a big eyeballs and a big nose and it was very scary for me, you know what I mean? For this girl to concentrate with me. And then slowly they are asked to become more and more mindful of what they are saying, allowing bigger silences between their statements, which on stage can be as important as words. Our faces are, giant, are just a giant freckle. I like to see Africans. There's more to life than just the weather. But sunshine is really important. <laughs> Natural light is important for your mental health. Is that why Irish people are so miserable? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what really annoys me? Is the gay people and lesbians. Being gay or being lesbian doesn't make you less human, if anything. It'll make you, it makes you more tolerant because you're used to the abuse from bigoted people. I yell at the people, especially grannies, they're so slow. Fabu, Fabu D, um, uh, it's, it's, he, he, I like him a lot. Like, in part of the workshop, um, he, Aiden got us to stare into each other's eyes. And I was, I, 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 I was fine with everyone else, but I knew when it was my turn to stare into uh, Fabu D's eyes for like an, a minute. And when I, when I looked into his eyes, I felt, you know what, I think you have seen a lot of hatred, a lot of intolerance. Uh, a lot of uh, discrimination and racism because of the color of your skin. I said that because I was joking. Like Dean Scorey said, feel free, talk about what you want to say, talk about your, your biggest fear, what you can't say, say it, just say it. So I just, that's what I did, I, I followed him. So you want to blame, don't blame me, blame Dean Scorey instead because he's the one that told me to say what I want to say. So. I think I might have to have a chat with Fabio at the next workshop because I think we have our wires crossed a bit. Right now, my money's not on the traveller, my money's on the Ballymore. A fiver, don't be holding hand back there like that, that's cheating. Come on, Thomas. All the boys are looking at you. Come on, Tom. I also had to have a chat with Thomas. It turned out he had a comedy gig booked for the same time as Aiden's workshop. I want to make sure he's still into this project. The reason why I couldn't make it here tonight, it was actually kind of tied between um, a talent show and this as well. But I still wanted to do this about more. But the problem I had was I actually arranged the talent show and kind of got everybody to get involved and then all of a sudden yeah. I was the one that couldn't go. In general, how are things going? Well, writing-wise I came up with a lot, well not really a lot, a couple of new uh, kind of short jokes. But um, I've done, like I said, I've done the talent show, but then the following Wednesday and Friday I've done two shows, one inside and one outside of the Finger Shoot Resource Centre. And everything I said was all the exact same, but I threw in a couple of extra jokes here and there and maybe changed a couple of words, obviously you can't remember every word for word. Great stuff. Perfect. I'm delighted you're, you're still on board, you're back yeah. on board. If you have any problems, all the way up to the gig, yeah. you know, it's, it's important that you kind of stay in touch, all right? Sexy stuff. Good stuff. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Later in the week, we took a trip out to the Finglish Youth Centre, where Thomas tries out his jokes on some of his friends. Thomas! It's a place where I come quite often to write sketches, record sketches. Uh, do a bit of stand up, uh, come down, uh, have a bit of a chill out for a few games of pool and stuff. He's, he's a good comedian, though. He's, he's always making us laugh, even 
when we're in lanes, when I'm back up with really, it's just always cracking jokes. It has new ones every day of the week. Have you a nuts lab? Uh, I done summer work at a bar last year, and uh, I'll never forget my first customer. A tall man, he runs in, he goes, give me uh, 10 shots of vodka, 10 shots of vodka. So I laid him out on the table. Uh, he drinks them as quick as he gets them. So I goes, what are we celebrating? He goes, oh, my first blowjob. So I thought it'd be nice, and he goes, here's one in the house. He goes, no, buddy. If 10 doesn't get rid of the taste, nothing, but... <laughs> There's a letter on my front porch for the last six months. If you wonder why it's still there, it says in the envelope, do not bend. So how am I supposed to pick it up? This is where I go. I go into the computer room to, um, to do all my writing and stuff, and um, get good. Uh, get me not good. Well, I uh, kind of bragging. I was saying get good feedback. I mean, just get feedback. It's not always good. But from the workers, they'll give you an honest opinion of what's good and what's not good. You know, kind of way. John, jo John, stand over there. Uh, Christy, go John. home. <laughs> <laughs> it, it helps quite a lot, and this actually was how I started doing it in the first place, because I had a little challenge with one of the youth workers in here. He got a little jealous of my funniness, and he just says, I, he was American, he goes, this is going to be a terrible American accent, but he goes, I challenge you to a stand-up battle. But he, I, we done it, he says, uh, five weeks time or whatever, four weeks later, I was just talking, having a pool, he goes, don't forget one more week. I was like, you weren't joking. So then we ended up, we worked together a little, first we were against you, we kind of, I helped him write some stuff, he helped me write some stuff, but I obviously won. Look, I don't need home. I think I'm kind of set now at the moment, it's just, Maybe working with a smaller audience again, I think might help me in the long run. I think that's the main thing, really. For the, for the thing on uh, the Friday 29, I definitely have uh, 10 to 15 minutes, but I won't go that far, I'll just do the 10. This week was also Pride Week and Dill was out on the streets hoping to find some inspiration for her routine. Well, as you can see, this is Gay Pride. It's absolute mayhem and there should be about 20,000 people marching in the Pride uh, Parade today. And a lot of people say, you know, why, why do you have to have the flag and why do you have to like wear your sexuality like a badge? But for me, it's very important because uh, since I was a little girl, I was told by my parents that I was unnatural. I was, uh, there was something wrong with me, I was abnormal, I was like a freak, you know? If you ask anyone, uh, we were ashamed of, of our sexuality and it's so amazing to be out on the main street of Dublin, shouting at the top, at the top of our voices, we are queer, we are here, get used to it. <laughs> what do we want? Equal rights! When do we want them? Now! What do we want? Humor has been such an important part of how we deal with our sexuality. Like, I don't know if it's going to happen today, but there have been almost every year when, when you march, you hear people in the sidelines. You know, a lot of them are cheering you on, but a lot of them are actually shouting obscenities at you. You know, what the drag queens usually do is they just turn around and then blow them a kiss. You know, that's what I hope to do with comedy. It's like we're challenging people's prejudices. We're also making people realize that. Just because you know, being heterosexual is not normal, it's just common. We have equality here, but there's still so many countries in the world where walking down the street with a, a rainbow flag would actually cost your life, you know? Places like Sri Lanka, my own country, where homosexuality is still being criminalized. Yeah, no, stop this. Oh, that's that's Yeah, no, say, we represent the gay people. Yeah, no, I'm saying this is the gay parade. Um, it's good stuff, you know what I'm saying? So, I'm enjoying it. Papa I'm enjoying Lee, it. Are you going to come out on the camera now? No, no but I'm, I, just no. Think, I just think it's good. It's good. I like everybody. Yeah, what's up? I love gay people. Yeah. One of these days there'll be a march like this in Nigeria and he was like, no way, there's never going to be, there's no gays in Africa. Like, ah, sure. Love to hate him, but you can't. You know? There's also, there's also a gay combination. Say, say, gay combination, you know what I'm saying? Papa Dean is one of us now, he's yeah. one of us. Yeah, well, for today, for today. Aha! For today. Yes. Tomorrow I'm straight, now, now I'm gay. <laughs> Back to the workshop where Aiden has given the guys some last minute tips. But the next time I would like you to have a three minute set, okay? 
I know you have a lot more, right? But pick three minutes of material that you want to work on and we can craft that and we can keep going over it and we can get your timing right and we can take out the words that aren't needed. Get something that you like, your own creativity, what you enjoy talking about. That's what's going to work best for you. Where you connect with the audience without words, just here and there in your set, it's going to make it a lot easier. Okay, guys, uh, we've done enough today. Uh, thank you for your time and thanks for listening. All right, so uh, thank you and fuck off. Thanks, mate. Aiden helped me figure out the formula. You know, how do you construct a joke and why is a joke funny? And, and there's so many different angles that uh, you can... Uh, be, be, uh, like, what he's given me is this formula and I'm going to go home now and dismantle my, uh, my entire routine and all my, my material and I'm, then I'm going to put it back together um, using the, the kind of uh, knowledge that he's imparted in, in the workshop. And I think it's just going to make my material so much punchier and edgier. Jill has something to say. She seems like a very... A uh, real, uh, gentle creature who wants to add to the world. I have no idea what I'm going to write about for my set for the next workshop, but I'm sure I'll get some ideas from work and from performing, and hopefully there's a lot of crazy people in between now and then who will uh, make my life a whole lot easier. Tabby has um, this uh, vivacious, uh, bubbly personality, and it's, it's, it's very entertaining. Just, just to listen to her, you know, her eyes sparkle, filled with life, and she's naturally funny. But can't she get that on, across on stage? That's, that's the question. I hope that she can. I, what I really like about the workshop was I overcome one thing, and the stuff I overcome was looking at people in the eyes. Because I, when I, I can look at people in the eyes naturally, but when I'm on stage, I lose that confidence. You know, I couldn't look at people into the eyes while I'm on stage because it's very, very, to me, it's so scary. and. I just don't want to see their reaction when I'm trying to tell jokes. It kind of disturbed me, you know, so I just don't want that to happen. I think he's got a lot, a lot of good jokes. He seems like he has jokes and he's confident with his jokes, but he doesn't seem to connect with the audience. And that, in most cases, is essential. Unless he can not connect with the audience and just, just ream through material. So I think he could learn a lot from just, boom, just being and letting people connect with him and then sharing his material. Uh, the workshop uh, with Aiden, that first workshop, that was really intense. That was, uh, was an hour and a half, two hours. Um, you, you could easily stretch that out over a weekend. So many interesting points through the whole lot. I think with a bit of experience that I had when I've seen gigs do work and not work, it was kind of good for someone to point out what does work and what doesn't work. And I was kind of, kind of going, geez, that's, that's why it didn't work or that's what made it funny. Because there's lots of times, even when things, I do make things funny on stage, I'm like, why was that funny? Or, or when it doesn't go wrong, I still haven't got a clue why, was that, why didn't that work. But to have someone point out these are the, the mechanics of those individual areas, uh, that was really good. I mean, I'm hoping I can remember a lot of what went on because there was a huge amount of information in that time. Sasha, I'd say, is a very good student. I'd say he, he's very willing to learn and to listen. He seemed to listen in depthly. I'd say he's quite a deep person. I mean, it's hard to tell in, in, a, in a short amount of time with somebody but I'd imagine that he should be able to learn and do a set quite well. Something going to go share, bro. I'll bet. I just get close to the person. I think I'd call you. I never do it. Hi, Mike. I don't want to have a girl. No, I don't want to do it. Right? Thank you, Mike. We'll make it up one. Good work, work guys. Ah, These sets better be work. funny, all right? Yeah, better all right. be funny. All right. All right. <laughs> There you go, thanks, you're not getting a hug, fuck off. <laughs> oh, look at you, you're videoing it, you perv. Next time on Journey of a Joke. Our five stand-ups had their second and final workshop with me. Their routines are really starting to come together. I was here last night, I happened to be sitting over there, and did you happen to see my geek? <laughs> Babu has a breakthrough. You actually proved me wrong, I think women are actually funny. Did you get that on tape? Tabby, on the other hand, is starting to struggle. She decides she needs to knuckle down and we follow her to Moore Street, where she hopes to find some inspiration for new jokes. What do you want? Uh, uh, no sex here. No sex. See you next time on Journey of a Joke. That's all of this, all I've got. Careful, pal. Thanks a lot. Hey. <laughs>